You ready to go, Mario? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, great. Take it away. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here sharing with you. I, I will tell you about my experience as a GitLab hero in 2020. I'm Mario Garcia, a GitLab hero from Mexico. You can find me on, on GitLab, Twitter, and Dep. So most of my contributions to, to GitLab as part of the GitLab Heroes programs were in the form of public speaking by presenting some talks at, at conferences and hosting a few workshops uh, last year and writing some blog posts related to the, the content that I presented at at some of those conferences that I had the opportunity to to spoke at last year, uh, in in the um, in the picture uh, um, that was from from uh, an event uh, that I is, spoke about uh, Python and, and GitLab uh, last December, and I also got involved with uh, event orga organization uh, by spreading the word about uh, some of the GitLab events that happened last year and helping with other um, activities. Well, um, in February, I just attended a few last in-person events. And in March, I decided that it was time for, for taking a break from, from speaking. Uh, I've been doing this for the last 12 years, um, well, almost. 13 years already, but um, I, I think I thought it, it was time for, for taking a break. Uh, at least that was the plan, but um, I just take uh, two months off and I just ended um, 2020 um, presenting um, a little more than 20 conferences, but I, I will tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. Uh, these are the stats of my participation as a speaker at some events last year. Most of the events that I, I spoke at were uh, virtual. Um, I just attended uh, two in-person events in February. And well, I, I just um, presented 20 conferences and hosted uh, five workshops. And from um, from that, uh, those um, Four, uh, four conferences and wor one workshop were in English. Uh, well, English is my second language and that's a little more than uh, um, than what I presented in 2019. I, uh, and from that, 40% uh, were about GitLab and I just hosted a, a three hour workshop um, at an event organized by by the Italian community. Well, uh, something I, I think was positive for, from all those experience, uh, experiences uh, speak, for, for me speaking at, at some conferences that I had the opportunity for, for going out of my comfort zone. I just presented more conferences in English than in 2019. Um, if you heard my story, uh, um, of me as part of the GitLab Heroes program in uh, last uh, GitLab commit. Um, I just shared that uh, my first conference in, in English was at GitLab commit London uh, in 2019. And I also uh, had uh, to record uh, a few talks. I had to learn how to use uh, a few tools like OBS Studio or Audacity uh, and Cadena with that were some of the tools that I had to learn how to use. And I wrote a few um, new talk and workshop proposals. Um, most of them were, were accepted. I had the opportunity to try new technologies. I just presented uh, conferences about that and share with the, the global community. I also had uh, some networking opportunities for meeting people from around the world. But I also had some tech problems related with um, 
the operating system I, I use and some of the tools that I had to use for, for speaking like Zoom, Jitsi, Stringer or, or Discord. Um, most of those tech programs were related with um, updates. Uh, I'm, I've been using Arch Linux and Arch based distributions for about uh, 10 years. Um, and some problems I had were, were related with, with the update. So uh, now I'm using my phone as a, as a webcam, but I, I, sometimes I, that uh, failed and I had to use the, the, web, the, the camera of my laptop that had uh, poor quality. I also had some problems related with hardware. Um, I, I've been uh, updating my setup. Um, I just um, changed um, my my headphones recently. That that those are, are the ones that I'm using now. I also had some internet connection problems where, where when I was speaking at, at some of those conferences and some problems related with audio. If you uh, watch my um, talk at GitLab Commit last year, uh, the audio is not uh, really good, uh, but uh, there's a, a blog post uh, uh, available that I just posted uh, a few months uh, later. Uh, I've been, uh, well, I, I wrote about uh, GitLab and how I've been using GitLab CI with Ross Python, Docker, and, and other platforms. I also wrote about my uh, participation as a GitLab Heroes and, and my experience using um, GitLab pages for some um, uh, projects. Uh, I just posted uh, four articles and a series uh, of articles that I that um, that has for uh, blog posts. Um, most of those those content uh, were in, in English in, in Spanish, and uh, I've been um, publishing those blog posts on, on depth and Punto Tech. Punto Tech is a, um, a publication, a medium publication uh, in Spanish. Uh, I posted um, two articles there. Uh, if I don't. Well, and I, I got involved with. Um, um, the organization of, of some events. L last year we had some GitLab meetups for Latin America. I got involved with uh, spreading the word and preparing a demo for, for one of the, the, the events that we had last year. And I also had the opportunity to present a talk about GitLab CI and Python in, in December. I well, and I also got involved with the GitLab Hero Summit organization and um, that uh, was um, my participation as a GitLab hero in 2020. Um, I, I will be sharing more about it. I had some uh, blog posts on my to-do list that, that I will publish in, in the following weeks. Uh, and I want to share how my experience was speaking at so many conferences and the tech problems I, I had and how uh, I, I solve them. So thank you so much. If you have any questions. Uh... Hey, thanks, Mario. That was great. Um, I think what we'll do is save questions for the end um, or you know, in the chat just to keep things moving. So if you have questions for Mario, put them in the um, chat for the stage. And I'm going to promote uh, Alejandro to join us. And, and Alejandro can start the next talk in just a minute. All right, yeah. Alejandro, you're up. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Let me share my screen. Can you see my my screen right now? My my presentation. Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Very honored. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit uh, 
about design ops with, with GitLab. Uh, I am Alejandro Mercado. Uh, as Mario, I am from Mexico. I am also DevOps Institute ambassador. Um, uh, I'm DevOps consultancy manager. Uh, we help companies in the DevOps or digital transformation journey right here in Mexico City. Um, well, <laughs> uh, if this seems familiar to you, uh, I mean the developer versus the designers, is pretty similar about the DevOps culture that traditionally we have silos, you know, different areas, not, not talking to each other. So, well, design is very important to, I mean, in the whole design uh, software process is huge, huge important. It's, 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 so what we are seeing now, they still are, are seeing is that the designers are not talking to, or no, are not talking too much to, to developers. So we have to find the ways to, to lubricate the machinery, I can say. So this is kind of common. And my experience, we, we see that a lot. So uh, design operations or design ops for sure is the or, or orchestration of an optimization of people, processes, and craft in order to amplify design's value and impact at scale. Uh, I, I don't see the difference. I mean, uh, talking about DevOps, the design process is must be in the same cycle. You know, this famous cycle of infinite loop that we must have to deliver fast and with a better quality. So it's like the same. So design operation is something that you don't see. It feels invisible and it just works. No? That's, this is something that, that uh, Dave Malouf, a uh, design ops leader, uh, put on the table on Twitter uh, almost uh, three years ago. So, so this is about design ops. It's a collective term for addressing challenges. So growing and evolving design teams and the part of the humanize, meaning that uh, you have to take care of the designers to, to have a great design and to involve the, the stakeholders in the whole process. So it's improving the quality and impact of design outputs. So if, if you want to see uh, the landscape of design ops, uh, design op practices should be defined based on the organization biggest gaps or pain points. Uh, maybe one of the first questions um, you must have when, if, if you want to implement design ops on a company, uh, well, you have to take in consideration these three, we can say three areas or practices, like how we work together, how we get work done, and how our work creates impact. So this is uh, something from a uh, Norman Nissan group that they, they made this research to see how companies are implementing design ops in, in companies. So, so there is no doubt that design is very important. So you have to, well, at the beginning, you have to organize, collaborate, and then humanize. Humanize meaning that the onboarding process and the career uh, of the designers, well, you have to take care of the career. Uh, and after that, you must want to on standardize, you know, to, to help the things going, harmonize and prioritize the design process. Uh, at the same time, you have to measure how, how, how are you going to improve if you don't measure things. So, so this is very important in implementing design ops. Socialize is, is giving visibility to the whole company, the stakeholders, and all the people related to the process and enable. So um, other authors, 
uh, talks about four pillars of design ops, the design process, you know, from discovery to review to high off, I mean, to the release of the piece of software, a mobile app or a website, or I don't know. Um, as I said, what are the, the, what are the metrics? Of course, the team contribution, design tools, and of course, the design culture. It's like pretty the same with, with uh, as the bots, you know, you know it's, a, it's a cultural thing. So uh, there are a lot of design tools like Figma, Sketch, uh, Adobe, XD, but well, in this case, uh, this is where GitLab help, help us. So there is a plugin so that can help us. It's pretty similar to have an issue so we, we we find it pretty useful. It's helping us and our clients to make the, the whole process uh, fluently. So uh, Figma is a powerful design tool. It's gaining a lot of popularity right, right now. So, well, I, I must say that the plugin is currently in beta, but well, it helps a lot of design things to have the same visibility metrics that we have as, as developers. So if you want to take a, a, a further look, a deeper look to the to the implementation of the plugin, there is a pretty good, well, of course, the, the official documentation on GitLab. And there is a, a video of Kristen Daibenko, who is also part of GitLab. So if you want to know how to set up and install the, the plugin, um, well, uh, as a conclusion, I, I can say, start with a team Kanban. I think that there is going to be a, a, another talk about Canvas. And this is because uh, you have to understand your current design team, where Gap exists and how you can grow. Uh, plan your processes based on guidance principles, find the right tools and start with a pilot project. So I can say that's a recommendation. So that's it. Thank you very much for having me here. Thanks, Alejandro. That's my first time actually really getting uh, an overview of design ops. I've heard the term, but never really understood it before. So thanks for sharing. So Will's up and uh, Will, take it away. So you should be hearing my audio because we've just had a little chat. So hopefully that's 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 good enough. Um, and in theory, you can see my screen now as well. Well, a, a portion of my screen. I only run things in windowed mode. Hopefully that's okay. Um, so. I'm going to be talking about uh, running GitLab and Terraform in Harmony, and hopefully that's going to be you know what people expect. You can see we're on a corporate slide deck again here, so um, yeah, it's it's going to be uh, lovely, lovely looking slides like Bethan's uh, session suggested earlier. Um, so with this being lightning, I need to talk quickly, right? Uh, this is a picture of me. I've got a new badge next to my shoulder on that, which is a, a professional service engineer one. Um, you should get that too, but I think you need to be a partner to do it at the moment. I wonder which number I am in, in people who've actually got this as, as external people. And these are all my other titles that I kind of work on. Um, at HeliCloud, which is the company I work at, we do lots of stuff with AWS. Um, and generally what we look at is uh, GitLab being kind of a central DevOps platform for us to be able to trigger off parts of running the infrastructure that we that we build and you can imagine that working with aws a lot we do a lot of infrastructure in general uh, i reckon there's two ways of provisioning infrastructure there's, there's there's terraform and there's doing another way which is wrong um so yeah we we don't have time for nuance in lightning um yeah terraform is the right way to do it and overall terraform is really about infrastructure provisioning and you're using apis to manage your infrastructure you can use it as infrastructure as code with a whole different range of tools. Now, what you can obviously do in GitLab is you can start to manage your infrastructure as code projects in Terraform as code and projects as you would any kind of software. Um, and you can also then do Terraform delivery, so infrastructure as code for doing CI CD and a whole range of other things inside there. And some of the newer things that's been added in the past, I think, year. Um, is that we can start to do state management and potentially we will be able to do Terraform registry or package management. And I'm going to link to the issue that's uh, being, being that at the end. So we're going to look a, a little bit at, at those kind of things of actually using GitLab as a 
landing point to be able to deploy your infrastructure. Now, generally speaking, to do this, we have to start using uh, GitLab as a backend for it. So you can custom set up your, your, your backend if you want to, or you can just put this in and it will choose the default backend from what you're running in, uh, inside Terraform, providing that you're running the GitLab Terraform uh, image. Um, inside your local machine, you'll need to initialize this Terraform state. So a state file is something that controls the setup of what you already have. And you need to set this kind of backend config so that it knows that it is going to be using GitLab as a state file. Um, there are various things here you'll be able to go through the walkthrough, but largely what we're looking at here is, is integrating with the GitLab API to be able to send um, re requests. And we're gonna be authentic authenticating with a username and an access token. And when you're using this in your CICD projects, you have to make sure that you're using the, the TF address that you've just named um, and that you're using the right um, location for, for the root um, for your projects. If you're running this in root of the actual project, then you don't need to, to obviously do anything else, but this is giving an example where we have multiple environments um, and you also need to give the correct name for state. I think the default one is default but if you're running multiple states inside the same project, then you would need to run multiple uh, different names. And you can get to something like this, where this is viewing Terraform state inside your projects. So Terraform state is on the, in the left bar, I think under operations. Um, so you can go and look at Terraform and you can have a, a numerous states inside a project. And this is uh, available to, uh, on the, the core product as well. So it's not something that you need to have uh, an elevated uh, use of privilege. Um, uh, you don't have to purchase license to, to do that. Um, I've got some examples here uh, as well. So um, I will put, ping these into the chat uh, afterwards, but there's an example about using the GitLab Terraform um, AWS item. Um, and there's also some an example here that about this is a Terraform serverless. So this is a project that actually goes a little bit further with Terraform. So we have Lambda and Terraform working together. And I actually added in Terraform compliance, which is like a, a testing um, suite for, for doing uh, testing on what you're running and also uh, an OPA, so open policy agent for running against Terraform as well. So we actually have start to be able to build our, our test compliance uh, into what we're doing and, and OPA is quite interesting for other things if you want to look at it because you can start to bring nuance into the changes that you're allow. You can allow a certain amount of changes, you can not allow deletions, that kind of thing. And I did promise that I would for, forward some links for, for, the, for the other items. So we've got things about Terraform merge requests where largely we're gen taking the JSON that's generated and we're passing this through through JQ, and we can put this into our merge request um, items, so we can see how many things are being changed. Um, you can also look at using the, the GitLab Terraform image, which is a Docker image that's configured especially for using with GitLab, so it has a whole series of items in there that are useful for using with uh, the GitLab CI system. And then there's a merge request, which is uh, on, on here, which is the around the Terraform registry, which has been languishing for a while, and I did try to contribute for a while. Um, but yeah, when this gets through, we should also have package management, um, so a Terraform registry that's available to run inside GitLab, which would be super useful because it's reducing the amount of tools we need. And that is the end of my slideshow. Thank you. Thanks, Will, for bringing the lightning. Um... That's the aim, right? Yeah, that was great, though. Um, and I think Marvin is going to be up next. Um, more, let's hope that the audio is working this time. No, we're still not able to hear you, Marvin. I'm sorry. The one thing that you could try is there's a gear 
at the bottom of this uh, video screen, or at least I see a gear. So there's a camera, a microphone, a screen share, and a gear. If you click the gear, you may just want to check what microphone you have um, you've set to for the stream to use. Um, that might be able to help. Takuya, if you're here, we can add you um, to go right now if you add yourself to the panel. Or Mario. Looks like Mario is also having technical difficulties. Mario, Takuya, or Marvin. Uh, if any of you could add yourself to the panel, we'll get you up. Um, if not, oh, let's see, Marvin's back. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you now. That's great. Third time is the charm. All right, take it away. Okay, so uh, yeah, as you have heard from uh, John, my name is... Uh, Marvin and I uh, happen to be part of the steering committee. And uh, basically what I thought about in this uh, presentation, I just wanted to talk about uh, being a part of something bigger. So yeah, being a part of something bigger in this sense, I wanted to talk about uh, community and uh, why the community is important, why the community plays an important role in uh, open source software and how to choose the right community that keeps uh, you focused and motivated how to grow as a community member, and uh, finally, why you should contribute and be part of an open source community. Yeah, so what is an open source? What is a community? So according to Wikipedia, a uh, community is uh, basically a social unit with uh, commonalities such as norms, religion, uh, values, and uh, customs and identity. So in our case, our community is about uh, an identity. So as a uh, GitLab heroes, so that's our identity. So it uh, basically empowers us as a community to talk about our passions, our ambitions, and a couple of other things. So how is uh, this community related to open source? So open source basically is uh, a freedom. So that freedom includes uh, maybe access to like source code, freedom to collaborate, and freedom to share ideas across multiple platforms. So basically, open source is a philosophy and uh, a movement. And what makes open source thrive is a community that grows up and around it. So basically, uh, let's go to our next uh, point, which would have been uh, why do you need to why do you need an open source community? So uh, you basically need an open source community to sort of like have that uh, identity as a group and a community where you gather around and uh, share a couple of ideas. So you also need a community to achieve personal goals. For example, like uh, I myself, I happen to be uh, an active uh, code contributor to like the GitLab source code. And one of the things about the communities, like uh, there are a couple of people who share in uh, in the GitHub channel for the contributors. Uh, they share like uh, tips and uh, hacks on how to do a couple of different things. And I find that this is something that has enabled me to grow as a developer and. Uh, also generally like to learn new things. For example, I think one of the things I learned how to use was how to use the Gitpod platform, which I found to be fascinating and uh, really exciting. So yeah, you also need a uh, community to have like that sense of motivation, because you know, like uh, GitLab had, has like this thing called the GitLab Hackathon, and a couple of people, you know, engage in this thing, so they sort of like compete and uh, share ideas and uh, do a couple of uh, other things within the hackathon. So in simple terms, uh, being part of the community can make us feel like we are a part of something. And uh, that's a feeling that I think everybody desires, especially if you are at a point where you feel like uh, you need to have some ambition in life. So how do you become part of the community? Contributing to an open source project is obviously the start but it's uh, definitely not the whole process. So you can start out by explicitly joining 
at the community. Like for example, most of the heroes here have uh, clicked on the heroes page and they have joined and uh, they have expressed their interest. So yeah, that's uh, some good way to join and become part of the community. So another way could possibly be reaching out to folks within the community. For example, when I started out contributing, I uh, reached out to a couple of folks on uh, the Gita channel uh, to help me in cases where I was stuck. But then I wouldn't, co I wouldn't have considered myself a community member, but I think it was an initial step that propelled me to join the community. So another thing maybe would basically be, like I've said, uh, interacting with the other people in the channel and uh, basically, you know, like uh, finding other platforms to engage with uh, people and asking them for, you know, like information on how to be a part of the channel, to be a part of the community. So finally, like uh, when uh, you have joined the community, so how do you recognize your involvement? Uh, how do you recognize whether you're making an impact? Because this is essential in terms of, uh, in the aspect whereby you, you're seeking to quantify what exactly you have been doing. So one of the ways that you could recognize your involvement in the communities, uh, some OS, open source communities have uh, established like methods to quantify contributions. And often people with more contributions tend to get more recognition. Uh, I think we have uh, that with uh, GitHub as well. There's uh, probably in the community section, uh, there's a section that talks about uh, top contributors for each year. So uh, other ways to recognize would uh, possibly be to judge the impact on the social media platforms. For example, like on Gita, uh, there are a couple of folks who have made uh, a huge, great reputation that uh, in case someone uh, like a newbie would uh, want like information, specific information to do something special, they would uh, reach out to those folks. So yeah, there are also like a couple of other ways like you could uh, get to see and uh, recognize your involvement in like a community is uh, I think other ways could possibly be in like, uh, I think what uh, Adrian had talked about earlier, uh, the coffee chats that are scheduled. Uh, I think that's also like a great way to recognize your involvement. So finally, I would like to conclude uh, this uh, presentation by saying thank you to the listeners and thank you to everyone and uh, personally send out my uh, special thanks to Nico and Mario who generously facilitated us with this template for the purposes of presentation yes. also I would like to extend my sins, my thanks to John and uh, the entire GitLab Heroes Summit organization team yeah so basically that's uh, what I had for you thank you everyone for listening Thanks, Marvin. Uh, that was great. And I'm really happy that we were able to get your audio working. So uh, thanks for the, the lightning talk. And next up will be Mario. <coughs> we're hoping that we have moved past the technical difficulties portion of the day. So uh, Mario, when you are ready, um, you can take it away. Hello. We can hear you, thanks. Perfect. So we just share my screen here. Okay, let's start. Um, yes, uh, my name is Mario and today in this lightning talk, I would like to give you, uh, well, I would like to show you why my team and I were rescued by the Kanban GitLab boards. So, um, just one second. So the Kanban boards were introduced uh, by Taichi Ono, an industrial engineer at Toyota in 1956, and to improve the efficiency and to gain the observability over what is currently going on. And observability is the important point here. So as we know what Kanban is, let's talk about the word Kanban itself. Kanban consists of two kanji symbols, and the first one 
uh, is Khan. This is the Chinese kanji symbol for the English word to watch. And and the second um, kanji symbol to form the word kanban is this one. In Japanese, the symbol stands for ban, and the English meaning of ban is board. And together, kan and ban symbols are formed the Japanese, uh, the Japanese word kanban, and the English um, translation is just signboard. Um, the simplest form of a kanban board is just a board where you can stick um, paper notes on it, and um, that's it. So. But in this lightning talk, I would like to shift your focus to the Khan symbol, the first of the country symbol, which means to watch. Um, and furthermore, um, I say watch. If I say watch, you can, um, and we together should think about to observe something. Um, as verbs, the difference between observe and watch is that observe means to view or a, a something especially um, careful or with attention instead of watch, which just means to be awake. Um, but why does the ability to observe something in detail just saved my team and me? So what's the reason behind our three year, why we are using our three year old Kanban boards still? So the reason for it is DevOps is dead. Um, during the past three years, on the community, so we perfectly managed it to um, change our working culture, but we did not change the organization of our work in the same way. So um, the first of two reasons for this is um, everyone is talking about digitalization and believes that digitalization is just an easy task. But to be honest, I think will never be maybe an easy task and easy to handle because there are a lot of complex things to handle about it. And the second thing is the developer first campaign, which started about three or five years ago, was extraordinarily successful. So we have a lot of developers today, but the operators were just left a little bit behind. And nowadays we have um, we have um, this proportion between the developers and the operators from 10 to 1 or even higher. So therefore, from a technical perspective, um, we must know what's going on. But that's not a problem today, because there are many solutions out there which are already solving the problem, the technical problems um, in many different ways. So the, techni the technology as such is not a problem. Um, but do you know? what you have to do tomorrow or what you must do in a week or a month, for example, which projects do you have to update in which time frame? So which libraries do you have to update, which operating system you have to update and so on. And how you will handle such things like um, outages or new and upcoming projects. Um, no, then you should use GitLab Kanban boards because Due to the GitLab Kanban boards, we today exactly know within my team what is going on inside and which updates we have to do when. So we can plan our work and we know which work we have to do and um, which um, lifetime cycles we have to manage to be um, fit in the operations. But that's not all. Um, with Kanban, we can also see what is currently in the queue, um, what is coming up, what we have to do next. And of course, as this picture shows, which tasks or which issues are currently closed um, and which ones we are juggling around at the moment and which one are already airborne. Um, as seen, an ops team has to handle many different tasks. And with Kanban boards, we were able to shift the organization of our work from classic DevOps thinking to a much more site reliability engineering team. And still the question is, why should you use the Kanban board for this shift? Well, because um, Kanban is flexible. We do not aim for perfection, because in the SRE team like I have, um, there are many different people on it. Some want to have a much more development focus, and some other ones, like I am, I have to make the organization as team leader. And the benefit of a Kanban board, if you use a Kanban board for to organize to organize your work is that you can 
easily change it at any time and you can um, be flexible as such. Um, as I said before, as a, as a, a SRE team with software and system engineers uh, on board have to handle a lot of different tasks. And I think use a Kanban board to change your organization of work and how you work, and then you can be rescued by Kanban too. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mario. Um, that was great and uh, cool to learn about the kind of etymology, I think that's called of the uh, word Kanban. Um, so thanks for sharing that. We had one more talk, um, one more lightning talk scheduled, but I don't think Takuya is with us and that's totally fair because it's about 2.30 in the morning, um, their time. So let's take a quick break um, and then we'll come back and do the panel discussion. So um, if you need to refresh your beverage or do whatever you need to do, check your email quickly. Um, and let's reconvene at 45 minutes um, past the hour. So in eight minutes, we'll kick off the panel. Um, so thanks everybody. And um, we'll see you back here in a few minutes.